Hello, friends, and welcome to World Build With Us, the podcast where we create fantastical worlds with help from you, our listeners. My name is Rob Hilferty, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Daniel Quinn and Courtney Staples. And today we are finally finishing up our time here in the fragment of a thousand lifetimes. This prompt was originally brought to us by our patron, Lord of All Chris's. And due to uh, some unfortunate scheduling issues, we had to postpone the ending until this week. And now that those issues have been mostly cleared up, I still have four holes in my body. Uh, well, more for new more holes, holes. Yeah. yeah for more holes than i should have is mm -hmm. what i should say uh in my body <laughs> then uh now it means that uh because if i had four that would just mean that i have less than i should right because we <laughs> anyway be concerning I, yeah right it seems like that would, that's not enough holes for a human to have <laughs> daniel what do you think too many holes not enough i know it's for daniel it's too many holes that's for damn true i have no comment on this <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, thank you for being patient with us as we uh, dealt with all of that nonsense. It looks like things should be clearing up in the future uh, as long as everything goes well. But as always, because this is the second part of a two-parter, I always recommend going back and listening to that first part before we get into it. Because, oh boy, you're going to be confused, just like we're going to be as we try to go through this. But... With all that out of the way, remember that if you want us to build your world, you can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com, click the link, follow the instructions, and within a reasonable amount of time, holes notwithstanding, you will be building your world. If you want to follow us on social media, don't, because Twitter's not very good right now. And just, just come to our Discord. The Discord is really where the conversations happen. Come chat with us. Come have a great time. Uh, if you want to introduce world building elements of your own, if you want to talk about your own world, if you have questions, come join us. We're very friendly. We're very social a lot of the time, some of the time. And uh, of course, if you, like the Lord of all Chris's, want to become one of our incredibly gracious, incredibly kind and generous patrons, you can always do so by going to our Patreon and giving us money. Uh, if you do so, you will get access to the patron-only Discord. You will get access to early episodes and, um, oh, all sorts of other good stuff. But with all that shilling out of the way, on to the episode. And the last time we left off, our twist was change the genre to paranormal romance. So, Courtney, oh, and, and the other thing before, Courtney, you're on deck. I just want to toss this out okay. there now. But I also have to remind our listeners that... Instead of bringing factions to this particular prompt, what we're doing instead is we're, ex we're exploring a thousand years of this particular setting. And instead of factions, we're exploring time periods. So, Courtney, you're going to tell us how you're dealing with the twist of paranormal romance. And you know what? While you're at it, if it makes sense, introduce mm -hmm. your time period. So go ahead. Hit us, Courtney. Tell us all about it. Okay. So one thing I had noticed last time, or when editing the last episode, was how much some of our concepts sounded like extremely severe depression, or even to an extent, something like Alzheimer's or dementia, like the fragmenting of memory and the fragmenting of self, the imperfect memories, the, the guilt that that one core being felt that drove mm. them to like cut themselves off from everything else. Um, it has this like element of tragedy to it, which is um, really fitting, Rob, given that one of your tenets was to make this a more uplifting setting. So to tie that in with the paranormal romance uh, twist here, I think that the split off beings are trying to track down the true love of this core being who's in this like depressed hermit state. Mm. And that true love, that soulmate isn't themselves immortal but exists after death as like a ghostly entity mm. and that person won't necessarily like fix the core being but could at least give them insight into why they're feeling the way they feel like help them organize their memories in a way that makes sense so you could like kind of see their relationship get told over this expanse of time if that makes sense that is absolutely fascinating and while it might seem thematically appropriate, I feel like only you, Courtney, only our <laughs> very own Lady of Pain, would be able to uh, pull that out from our previous setting. 
Uh, or, or maybe not the only one, but certainly the one who's most qualified to talk about it. So, yes, yes, yes uh, I'm, I'm here for that. I love a lot of those concepts. And I like the idea that the true love that we're talking about here uh, isn't necessarily just an individual, but maybe it's the dead fragments of the self. So it's about self-care, mm. self-acceptance and self-love. And those ghosts are actually just memories that they forgot they had or something like that. Uh, yeah. Just That's tossing it out there, guys. I'm just thinking. Mm -hmm. What what do you see as the um physical setting for this in the time period? Um Well, I think I think that we're doing over a thousand years that we're gonna have a couple of them, right? Like that's the whole point of our, our second part, right? Or do you want to know what Courtney's is? What Courtney's is in particular. Ooh, okay, oh, okay. oh for, so for my point in time, it's not necessarily related to the paranormal romance aspect, though we could certainly tie it in, I think. But um, my thought was like, this point in time is right around when some sort of rapid transit starts up between the moons and the central planet that we had talked about last time, where the, the core being is kind of hermited away on the central planet and mm -hmm. its fragmented selves are on these different moons that have broken off from the planet and whether that's in the form of like space elevator type things or teleportation gates or space trains or whatever and since we're kind of focusing on that core being whose self was fractured and who went into self-imposed exile on the planet and picturing this from his point of view or its point of view where it's been watching these transit modes get constructed from afar but because its memory is imperfect and fractured it can't tell what exactly is going to happen next which is terrifying to it mm. and so it thinks that these connections are a huge mistake but it doesn't know why and because it's put itself into that immobile hibernation that daniel i think was one of your tenants last time it can't really do anything except for watch these connections being made across gaps in space cool so you're picturing like kind of like um birth of transit sort of yeah, like birth of some sort of very advanced transit that allows these moons to connect finally. I'm feeling like um, potentially, even though it, this would suggest, you know, like a sci-fi-ish uh, mm -hmm. future, I'm, I could also see that it's being painted with something that's more um, wistful and not steampunky, but like Victorian almost in its styling. Like I'm thinking like those retro futurist pictures of like Victorians on the moon. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I can see that yeah. working, you know. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I, I would also like to not gloss over the fact that when you say that you make these connections, that what I'm thinking of is that there is the literal making connections between mm -hmm. mass transit stops. And then there's the more metaphorical connection of like making, you know, like you have a meet cute on a train, right? And mm -hmm. so now what we can do is we go through each of these three time periods that we're about to explore tie public transit to it. So every mm -hmm. time this person meets their ghost or their beloved is on a public transit system. And then we can kind of create an interesting thread that ties those three time periods together through literal connections and romantic mm -hmm. connections as well. I think thematically it might work remarkably well. Yeah. Yeah. I think that works. And sort of on another level, it's like these synapses being formed in the core being's brain as it starts to like remember mm -hmm. things properly and like sort of re reform itself into its natural state. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that absolutely makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and Daniel, can you just stop spoiling people on my part of the, the time period? Because like, come on, man. Uh, like, was it Victorian <laughs> retrofuturism? <laughs> it wasn't retrofuturism. It was just straight up uh, Victorian era shit. Oh, so nice. like, if okay. you could not, that'd be great. You know, <laughs> maybe, maybe hers is like an advanced version in the sense that it's further in time. So yeah. it makes sense as a revolution, you know? That's that was my point is that we have like Victorian era trains and then Courtney's mm -hmm. are like space trains yeah. and like oh, either way, gosh. like space trains to like to making these connections is like that's a cool, you know, like thing mm -hmm. that are kind of meet cute romantic kind of partnership that you can have as well. You know, there's there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah, what's what's um the anime? OK, I know I'm, I'm referencing an anime, but it's wow. a classic uh, one. Hold on. Uh, this is two in a row. <laughs> Daniel, this is two episodes in a row that you've now talked about anime positively. What's going Miyazaki on? Is Miyazaki the one that does all the really good children? Studio Ghibli? 
Yes. Like I'm yeah. picturing, you know, in a lot of the scenes where it's like kind of um, a down up shot and you're looking up partially at the character in the sky. So I'm picturing like, you know, a train being looked up at or passing by mm-hmm. and there's like wind, but then it's like it's zooming up further and now you're moving in time towards, you know, looking at the train oh, in yeah. space. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know, yeah, like yeah, I can yeah, see yeah. that shot transition between the two That's settings, cool. you know, yeah. or in reverse rather. <laughs> if you Absol- had gone yeah. first. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I, I get it. No, I can, I can totally yeah. see that as well. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, speaking of Daniel, why don't you introduce, how did you reconcile with the twist of this suddenly? Well, actually, no, we're, wait, where are we? <laughs> we we kind of did we, both yeah, at once. We bounced so. over. We bounced yeah. around a little bit. Are we still in the record? Yeah, we are in the record. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, Daniel, tell us about the reconciliation <laughs> on the twist. Where are you with that? What are you thinking about? Um, I, I, you know, I have some more sentiment. Um, so I think we're all in the same space, but I went to the distant, distant future. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, at the, at the edge of this time period that we say is a thousand year period, but whatever the period is, the very edge of it. And it's interesting that you, Courtney, you're talking about, um, the moons now being connected by some kind of transit system because I'm putting it so far in the future that the moons have drifted away from the planet uh, to such a degree that mm. the people who live on the moons can no longer move between them and the technology to travel in space has been forgotten. And the people don't even know that the original planet exists. Like they, okay. that's how separated they become. And in terms of the, the, paranormal romance part of it um I, there's a movie that does this i don't remember what the movie was where it's like someone on earth makes contact with someone else some farther in the solar system that's farther away and so their communication is slowed but i'm thinking in this situation there's like an astronomer who lives on one distant moon who makes contact with someone on another moon and that's where the romance mm-hmm. is and but they're both haunted by memories of this planet that they don't know about and that mm. they don't have the technology to get to and that people are forgotten. Like I'm talking like it's over in the future. They've kind of gone back around, right. To, to simple Galileo kind of ex- existence. Um, and they have to work together to find on their own moons, which I think would be now the old rail system from Courtney's prompt mm. to be mm. able to connect again. And maybe the reality is that they're not really two different people, but they're the, the same beings. Like they're the, they're the mm-hmm. time being yeah. split across the moons. I really cool. thought that you were going to reference yet another anime. I will never. And I was going to be like flabbergasted. <laughs> and I don't use that word lightly. I mean, I was going to be like, this is like Courtney trying to introduce as many cute elements into a story. Genuinely cute. Not just I do like- that sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, no, the silence speaks volumes. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's like when you take an apple, you know, like a caramel candy apple, but it goes in blood instead of caramel. <laughs> That's what she means by cute. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's like, oh, you know, like orphan murder's cute, right? Like that's kind of like whatever. God damn, wow. Courtney. Wow. <laughs> Any anyway, yeah. Anyways. Okay, that, no, I I like that idea a lot. Is that you're communicating and when you say haunted daniel can you explain that a little bit more please i i mean this i guess that's how we could use the paranormal part it could be that they have these memories that haunt them so like dreams they can't get away from or visions they can't get away from but they're real memories of a place they've actually been Mm -hmm. that maybe because they become in contact with each other they're starting to remember them oh they made radio contact idea idea okay can we make it so the each person thinks that the other one looks like someone that they loved in the past who was dead? So it's like they think that they're talking to someone who is basically a metaphorical ghost, but in reality, they're just themselves and they're remembering past aspects of themselves. Does that make sense? Can you elaborate? Like I was so okay. far, I was just picturing these are two separate people on different moons, but they're part they of the same are. being. You know? Okay. So, so think about it this way, right? Like, um, imagine that your wife passes away and then like 20 years later, you meet someone who is an exact duplicate of them. Right. But you're meeting them through some kind of like long distance, you know, like internet based zoom chat. Right. So to them, you're, you're being haunted by your loved one, 
but it's a new relationship. You're, you're gaining this thing. So that's where I'm thinking that the one, the romance comes in and two, the haunting comes in is because you're looking at this person like, Oh, I love this person. This isn't who they are. And then, and then the other person is also thinking that as well. It's like, wow, you really remind me of, you know, my ex-husband or something like that, you know, or like my, my deceased husband or something like that. I like the like the uncanny familiarity aspect yeah. of it, like yeah. that they have somehow know each other already. But I think like what I want them to be mostly haunted by, I mean, in addition to that, is this memories of a place they've both been that they mm. literally in their lifetimes have never been to. And that's because they're part mm. of the larger time being who is trapped on that planet. Oh, I see. OK, 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 OK. Hold on. I think I, I think I have a way that we can reconcile this. Can we. Have it so, so maybe we drop that part, right? Maybe. I mean, I like I like the familiarity built in, yeah. Because in a way, they yeah. have lived lives like that together, right? Okay, but, but hold on. So maybe they haven't been there, but their partner is the one who's told them about this place. And when they start describing it to each other, mm-hmm. they're like, "Wait a minute, does that?" We've so both been there, yeah. That kind of yeah, thing. that that's person has been there, but they haven't. And so that's where that haunting familiarity kind of comes from. Like neither of them have ever like they they are suddenly because they're communicating they're having memories of having been there. Ooh, that's good too. That's, that's what I mean. Good like yeah. they make. I'm, I'm picturing like I'm picturing like if you want to do times to answer like the question I posed to, to Courtney, like this could literally be setting wise, you know, uh, 1985 looking right. It's like a Steven Spielberg setting. <laughs> it's just normal people. Maybe they're two kids that get on a bicycle and find this old radio telescope. They don't really understand what it is because the technology is, is misunderstood. They like dial in and hear this other voice on the line, right? Mm-hmm. But the more they start to communicate, like you're saying, they start to understand these memories they're having. And the two of them can work out, oh, there is this third place, right? And there are other moons or things like that. Mm-hmm. And they start to realize that it's way more complicated, you know? And then they also, maybe like you said before, they also start to think of this person as someone they already know, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so that works. I, li- I like that. Also, can we now codify that we have some kind of like cassette deck futurism yes. involved yes. here? That's what I'm thinking. Oh, Spielberg yeah. has cassette. I like that cassette yeah. cassette deck futurism. Yeah. <laughs> you have to like, point that. Or it's like the the uh, or it's like an alien where everything's like still super analog and still like uh huh chunky yeah. and mm-hmm. stuff totally. like that yeah mm-hmm. like that's fun I like that idea VHS kind of yeah I like that yeah like literal cassettes right where it's yeah. like obviously it's like oh no they're putting in cassettes it's just that they look like cassettes but they're actually like memory discs yes, or something like exactly. that it's just that cassette like they just look like eight track tapes or something mm-hmm. like that you know because yeah, we think f- far future always oh, going to be like some kind of dystopian disrepair you know or like a bunch tape. of neon yeah the, yeah like, right? it's like it's either chrome and neon or like yes like wally apocalypse, like, apocalypse. And I'm thinking, yeah make it 1985 people are wearing like sweatshirts and they live in like normal houses and you're like what is this why is this is like a weird normal setting yeah. but then you realize oh it's actually like Super far in the future, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really cool. That's fun. I like that because if we're telling this story linearly, right, then Courtney's would seem to be as though it were the furthest in the future. But in reality, Daniel's is the furthest mm-hmm. in the future. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then when that reveal kind of happens where it's like, oh, wait a minute. Or, or like throughout the story, right? Daniel's setting is kind of revealing itself as to be like super far in the future, mm-hmm. but it's just that mm-hmm. the tech looks so familiar to like an eighties type thing that it's like there. Ooh, Ooh, again, plays into that kind of theme that we're messing with where it's like an uncanny familiarity yes. that yeah. works thematically as well for your future. The, the cassette deck futurism that works so yeah. good. Oh, I man. love that term. You yeah. need to go too. Rob, write another essay. <laughs> and establish cassette tech futurism. Copyright that it. term. Go for it, Daniel. <laughs> it's you. You're getting the PhD. This is your job now. <laughs> I'm not getting a PhD. I'm getting a master's. I might get a PhD later, but it's not next right steps. now. Yeah. I'm setting you up for it. <laughs> I, no, I'd rather not. Um, <laughs> it's like a lay- is that what they call it in the basketball? Where it's is it a layup? The basketball. Oh my is god, that, Daniel! Sports is that what it's called? A layup. Yeah. Yes, it is in wow. fact a layup. That's yeah. just for you. Rob. Congratulations! Wow, I'm so proud of you, Daniel. <laughs> See, I did it. What did you watch? A sports anime recently? No, or? I just that came to mind. <laughs> wow. wow, I'm so impressed. What, what did you watch? Space Jam too? Like, why is this in your? You brain? know, there was a time where the only sports ball that I've watched in my life was the Houston Rockets. 
Wow. What, with Hakeem Olajuwon and stuff like that? Or? I don't know anything about that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> never mind then. <laughs> oh, man. That's, oh, that makes, I don't know why that makes me ridiculously happy, Daniel. That tickles me in a way that I was not expecting, let me tell you. Oh, boy. All right. Uh, so I, I don't have a good transition for mine, but that's a good reconciliation. Uh, I basically already told you how I plan on reconciling with the shift over to a paranormal romance. Uh, I just got it in during Courtney's because I'm like, whatever. I love the idea of like a romance that threads throughout these three timelines. And because it's a paranormal romance, we can have it be that same kind of lover thing all over again. And and mm-hmm. I, I think that thematically it works. It, I mean, is it a little bit lazy? Yeah, maybe, but I don't fucking care because hey. we're literally doing a thousand years of time in in history in this. So I'm like, yeah, but I'm now going to also double, double segue into my time period because fuck y'all I'm going first. Um, oh, I, I thought we already, I mean, I already did my time. Period. Shut the fuck up, Courtney. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Oh, but yes, continue. Right, okay, I had remaining. more to mind than just like, <laughs> oh, it's like a time where this happened. Like, fuck off, Courtney. What do you got for me? God damn it. Anyway, I'm going Victorian times. More specifically, I'm thinking like Berlin around like the late 1800s during the first kind of labor union stuff into maybe the second wave of labor union stuff. So like early 20th century. So what I'm more interested in, right? I'm more interested in confronting and kind of exploring a relationship between one of these aspects of time, right? Like a, and because we're switching it over to public transit trains, you're damn right. We're doing train travel. We're doing Mm -hmm. public transit in the form of trains, whatever. That's where it's going to be. The love figure that I have in mind is an owner of a railway company now because it was going to be something different, but this is different now. And what's going to happen is that he's going to fall in love with one of the people uh, with with a ghost, obviously, because, again, Mm -hmm. paranormal romance. Uh, They're falling in love with a ghost during the time of massive labor union strikes and massive labor union uprisings. I think it'd be really interesting to kind of approach it as this is a character who, if you're following it closely along to the camera, he's going to come across as sympathetic. He's going to come across as like maybe naive and you're, you're going to be rooting for him from a romantic angle. Maybe he's not the owner of the railroad company. Maybe he's the son of the owner of a railroad company, something like that. But I want the backdrop of labor unions to be like in, so so kind of like how in Pan's Labyrinth, the backdrop is the Spanish Civil War. It kind of plays second fiddle, but then eventually comes into the main story. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of that when I'm thinking of this romance where this person's going to have a paranormal romance with a ghost. And it just so happens that uh, these labor unions are happening in the background until they can't be contained in the background anymore. That's my whole deal. That's what I'm thinking of. God damn it. That's where I'm going. And what do y'all think about that? One question I would have, and I, I also, we, ha- we, we could pose the same question to Pan's Labyrinth um, is in what way is um, the struggle struggle of labor connected to the, to the romance itself? Like, so how, how do they mirror each other? Um, because I wonder um, what's how, because like, there's certain things in Pan's Labyrinth, like during the whole conflict that's happening in the background, that is a pantomime of what's happening to the little girl going mm-hmm, through the labyrinth mm-hmm. and dealing with her, you know, mm-hmm. her heritage. So I wonder what can we do? What can we play with from, from labor and from the longing that's happening between the two characters? Okay. So, or class struggle. I'm, I'm not sure. So, first of all, I before we even get into it, that's a great fucking question. Daniel, Mm -hmm. that is the type of insightful, amazing nonsense that I want from you all the time. And when I say nonsense, that's not derogatory in any way. I am genuinely in love with you in this moment. Okay. Um, So what I, what I'm considering, and I'm not sure how deep I want to go with it, but the concept that I'm kind of working for here is what people in labor want are more rights, more human recognition, 
more, uh, you know, like they, they don't want to be abused anymore. Mm-hmm. So maybe what we can do is we can use the relationship as a sort of liberatory uh, experience for our principal character. So maybe them falling in love is kind of their way to gain recognition, to gain the thing that labor actually wants. And then you go from this character not really caring about labor very much to a character who is now supportive of the labor movement. And there's a number of ways that we can do this. One, originally, my idea was that this ghost is actually, is a dead laborer and then they they understand that or they that becomes revealed in the story, but I'm not necessarily sold on that. Mm. Uh, but the other thing is like we can make it so that the relationship between them is forbidden for more than just class reasons as well. And it could be like a same sex romance. It could be, um, you know, like uh, well the the cl- the class one works as well. What what do y'all think? That that's kind of where my headspace is right now. Yeah, I wonder too if we can like since we have these themes of like fragmentation and reformation and stuff of that sort, like, I mean, unionizing itself is a, a formation to build a stronger organization. So in a way that kind of parallels the direction of the story where like yep. this fractured thing is sort of trying to almost reluctantly unite itself. So I think that, yeah, there's like a parallel there that we could, do more with too. And, um, actually I was going to say something else. (laughs) Well, I like where you're going with that. At least I think that's a really good way to start like unionizing, uh, or as like a sort of community builder as a way of creating connections. Uh, that's, that's a smart way to approach it as well. Uh, there's also this idea that I think is interesting is that we could have it. So the villain of the story, the kind of father is in fact one of these principal time beings, right? And this this other uh, son or, or daughter or whatever can also also be one of those time beings. So maybe mm-hmm. reconciliation happens on two levels. There's the romantic one, and then there's the familial one. And maybe we can make it so there's more connections happening than just a romantic one involved. I, I, I'm just mm-hmm. tossing so it out. So are we saying there's like... Can you lay out the characters again? So I, I think I get it. So you're saying there's like a, a child to the father who's at, the one connected to the to the railroad or owns the railroad. And then the love relationship is with another child who's like the, the ghost. Well, it's not a child. I, 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 when I say child, I mean like this is probably like a grown like ass man. Young adult. Yeah. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Like 18 to 20, 25, yeah. let's yeah, say. Yeah. Right. Really hit those like really hit those like mm-hmm. key demographics when it comes so to the, the Juliet kind of Romeo. No, ideally. Juliet was like 12. Like 15. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. From the yeah. movies. So <laughs> like, bit, you know, older, actual yeah. legal age. Um, so we're talking about my point is like there's a there's a there's a but I say child, I mean like the son or daughter of this real person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And they're the ones that are falling in love these two. C- correct. So there's like okay. the, the offspring of this rail owner who is also a time being. Mm-hmm. Right. Be- and so they, Oh, make the, make the um, labor organizer be also a time being. But now we have four time beings and that's getting a little out of hand. Right. But that's, that's how crazy this is. I think well, here, let me run with it for a second. So you've got, so you got so, cuz you you'll have two parallel narratives you'll have if you have the labor time being and the um rail owner they're in a labor a class struggle right the one wants rights and recognition the other one wants to control the, the rail and keep things running right and he's kind of a businessy scroogey type but they're they're technically the same being and they technically have the same needs at the end of the day from a narrative point of view then you have the two Ooh. kids who belong, I assume, to two different, uh, they're coming from different like socio classes. Like he mm-hmm. one that belongs to the rail owner, the other one maybe, maybe the other one is the daughter, the son or daughter of the labor organizer. But they're dead. Remember that. That That's kind of the principal dead. idea because the par- yeah, that's where yeah. the paranormal aspect comes yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. So, I, but, well, we get a lot in that part, but like, but so like it, it maybe, maybe the, the labor organizer is actually dead too. I don't know how. But if, if okay. that's the case, that you have like a romance that has to be recognized, reconciled, and you have a labor struggle, and they're also connected by family okay. ties. I I have an idea for like the ghostliness and people being dead. Is like, what if the 
and also for there being like a fucking billion time beings what if like being around one of the main time beings for extended periods like that that nature almost like bleeds into what's around it so the ghosts that we're talking about are almost like stuck in or they're experiencing time in the same way that the time beings are because they've like been in the general vicinity and they've soaked it up almost like a okay. radiation is affecting them. Okay. I, I think I, like I can that. run with this. I, I like yeah. that idea. I think that works, mm -hmm. but I, and I think I have a way that we can kind of square everything and not mm -hmm. have a million time beings in the same. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to keep your Romeo and Juliet Capulets Montague style thing where mm -hmm. we have labor and, uh, and parasite, right? And those are both time beings. The labor oh, organizer. I like your analogy there. It's, be it's very beautiful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> labor parasite. Yeah. So so there's Capitalist like the labor union. And the labor union. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so so there's the laborers, right? There's the labor union. That's that's the primary principle. Okay, we got that. Mm -hmm. That's a time mm -hmm. being, right? And yeah. then we have the capitalist. We have the owner of this uh, train station. He himself is a time being, but... In a there will be blood style thing, he's adopted a child rather than have them mm. be an actual time being. So that works. And then the the radi the time radiation thing that Courtney's talking about happens with the adopted child. And then that child then starts seeing into the past and sees echoes of the dead labor union's uh, offspring and starts becoming... Mm, yeah more like drawn to labor union based on this. So we're mixing a couple of different things here, including like, oh, well, we've got, you know, like the trope of someone, so-and-so is dead all along. That's absolutely being done here. But that way we cut it down to two time beings again. Mm -hmm. And we have what I think is a lot more interesting story as a result. I like That's work. cool. Yeah, I like that. Great. Okay. Oh, <laughs> hashed out, hashed out. Let's fast forward. Courtney, you're in the middle here. You're sandwiched mm. between Daniel and I, the sexiest sandwich, <laughs> um, which is, which is ironic consider. Well, anyway, I'm not going to go there. Uh, so Courtney extend. So tell us how the world has changed in this time period. Tell us how the story moves forward, how the world has changed, what looks different about it. Tell us everything that's going on here. Um, so yeah, my, my time period that I went over before was when rapid transit was starting up between the moons and the core right, planet. Right. And I feel like the, the creation of the labor union probably directly led to that happening. Like the formation of such a strong collection of people, um, probably working towards the greater good is what ultimately led down the road to this organized rapid transit between the moons to connect everybody in terms of like styling i'm not sure where to go with it because i do like the like victorian retro futurism that we were talking about before so i think that would be a cool direction visually you could consider um the we've talked about this in last night when we were on the movie thing um kind of an ayn randian um i like uh, the art deco the yeah the art yeah. deco style from like what are the video games again um uh, bioshock Bioshock is a good example. Um, and the renditions of Rand's books mm -hmm. recently usually follow that style. Yeah, that could be cool too. So you just want, you want art deco as a, mm -hmm. as a natural extension of Victorian era ish stuff. Yeah. Like maybe like make it look a little f futuristic, modern sleeker is what I mean. Mm -hmm. Metal, rude <laughs> and metal. Yeah. The great capitalist metal. Mm, but but also in space. space. Although if we're yes. so if we're doing like labor union focused future, maybe it's like more emphasis on the importance of labor, like bringing in that sort of uh, communist uh, Soviet Union type oh, imagery. Soviet styling. Yeah, yeah. I like that more. <laughs> so are we talking brutalism or are we talking something else here? Because because when I think yeah, of maybe Soviet, a little bit of brutalism. Yeah, I'm thinking like brutalist style architecture when I'm thinking mm. of that, which is like, you know, maybe mix it, give it some pop of color, some retro color. Like, so the kind of the retro Soviet style, like I, I'm just picturing like, yeah, God, I can't think of any artists at the moment, but like 
I don't know. Like, you know, you know, those, okay. You know, those um, paintings of like astronauts that are like from the sixties and it's like retro futuristic mm. styling, yeah. but just take Soviet yeah. stuff and add brutalism. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So, so hold on. Yeah. So you want to take the the carousel of progress colored. from Disney World? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> brightly colored. They're like oil paintings usually, right? And and you give it like the freaking sickle and hammer, right? <laughs> and, and but and the buildings instead of being they're brightly colored, but they're brutalist structurally. Like they're squares and very brutalism. Spot. Brutalism is antithetical to like exactly concert, like, like multicolored brutalism. That would be amazing. <laughs> oh my god! This is Lisa okay. Frank brutalism in space. I'm not. I'm not an architecture person, but mm. even I know that like the dissonance of this is like making yes. me throw up in my mouth a little bit. Yes, like, it's like you're I, level crazy. I loathe this, and I'm okay <laughs> with it, like being in the setting. But like, I'm like, I hate that. I it's hate a that reaction so much. to the grimness of the previous time period where this they is were just under no. The thumb we're just creating favelas in space. That's all we're yes. doing. Yes. <laughs> what I'm also oh. wondering now, though, is like thinking about the timeline and what happens when. Is like, is this the middle timeline, or does it come after? daniels like after those connections are remade between the moons and something is able to pull them back together you know what i mean i like that's that that is interesting okay maybe that is the trick of our setting and that the direction of time is irrelevant not irrelevant but the direction of time is flexible right right like you can kind of tell a story no matter Mm -hmm. what the order is which fits perfectly with the concept of the time beings oh my god it's beautiful (laughs) You can start or end with the with the the labor struggle. You can start mm-hmm. or end with finding the people that you've lost. Yeah. Can we? Okay. 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 I'm thinking about this now, and I'm thinking that it's kind of interesting to kind of go this direction. I'm thinking about this in two ways. One, I'm thinking about this like a literal, like a literal, uh, train station, right, or like a, a railway, right, where. On one end, you have station A. On the other, you have station C. And in the middle is station B, right? And those those trains go both ways. That's how transit works, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe like we can kind of keep that going. And what happens is we tell labor stories mixed with love stories of different types in each one. So there's still those thematically strong connections between all three stories. Mm -hmm. But like you're saying is that we can tell from A to B, from B to C and from C to B and from B to A. Does that make sense? Or did did I just like word vomit a little bit? (laughs) (laughs) Say it one more time. (laughs) Oh, with feeling. (laughs) What, What I'm thinking is that temporally, I think that there should be strong connections from A to B And from B to C, and there's a thread that pulls them all through all three stories. Oh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it suggests a direction. I think what we're saying overall is that, like, um, you can start the thread in either direction, but they're connected. Like, there's clearly a pull between – there's clearly a cause and effect between – my multicolored brutalist Soviet wonderland. God, fuck you, goddamn. And <laughs> the dusty, uh, um, what what is the robber baron Victorian era, right? Mm. Mm. Uh, but but and, and 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 you can tell them in one direction, but you're it's never really clear, I guess, from an objective, omniscient point of view, which came first. Yeah, like for example, you could read it as the Soviet multicolored Yodorowsky Funland <laughs> devolved into the robber barons or the labor movement succeeded and created the fun house of um, economic wonder. Mm-hmm. Do we remember, do we remember cassette deck futurism? Can we go back to that yes, rather than I like that too. multicolor oh, brutalism? Man. Like, can we just not like, do you like do my that? fun house, my fun house communism? <laughs> it's not communism. Communism and brutalism are two different things, Danny. I mean, this it's as if the Soviet Empire succeeded and moved into the third stage. But it's That's also fascist. Saying. It's it's fascistic. The fascism like, fell away after time because of the multicolored dreamland. It just oh, took a couple more centuries. Courtney, kill Daniel for me. Can you just <laughs> I'm sorry, I meant his ideas, but also maybe a little bit of him. the real like, person. Yeah, as well. I, I can do so many adjectives with this. Oh man, and I haven't even started drinking it i mean it is a bit early actually where you are it's not too early but i mean you know. it's noon i'm already past two hours past <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> let's okay. Let's create some cohesion here, shall we? Mm-hmm. Can, can we create some co goddamn cohesion, please? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I've got my story pretty much settled. What are the stories that we're connecting to that inevitable? And actually, let, let's do this. What's the inevitable end goal result of all of this? It's to create connections, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, how are we creating these deeper, me- more meaningful connections between all three? I'm guessing, I'm seeing this as so the ghost in my story is also the lover in Daniel's story between the lost transmissions, right? That's what I'm seeing. That way we can have like, oh, wow, that's just a time being slipped between those periods, right? So that's what I see. That I think is an easy extension. But what do y'all think? I think the nature of the whole thing is that these time beings are supposed to be like Dr. Manhattan in that they don't, they don't have a memory of all of everything as we've established, but they, they do have no um, singular experience of time. So in the sense, they're already connected. I don't necessarily think we have to say like person A is in fact person B in other in the other story, because part of what the prompt was suggesting is that this is told from a, um, Isaac Asimov kind of detached yeah. Right. storytelling perspective like it's popping in and out okay time periods so i don't you could have that be the case but you don't have mm-hmm. to is what i mean right but but, but I, i'm just trying to stick with the prompt which is paranormal romance which i think we've right. done pretty well so far but if that's the case we want to shift perspectives a little bit and we want to give more credence to the shift in the thousand years then let's talk about that like, like what moves how does, between periods is what you mean? Right. Like what has changed between those time periods? Oh, okay. And if we're using public transit as a through line, mm-hmm. then maybe we tell what has changed through the public transit. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's fair. I mean, I can say on mine, the transit, it's not only has disintegrated, but it has been forgotten about. Yeah. And the communication between these two kids, since it's a Steven Spielberg movie, is <laughs> discovering this technology and activating it. Right. Mm-hmm. And then with mine, it's the connections being formed, like from the point of view of that core time being who's just watching, afraid of what's going to happen mm. next because it doesn't know. I think I think the the issue that I see is the dissonance between the progression. So like Courtney and I, we make sense because we're about establishing connections, right? We're literally and metaphorically. And then Daniel, you're talking about a severance. And I found that like we are not talking about that severance necessarily. So I feel like if we had a fourth person where it's like, oh, mine's all about like the the disconnect that happens, like cool then we'd have a complete story, but I feel like we're missing a fourth part here. Does that make sense? I guess it depends on how much time you put between you guys. Mm -hmm. two settings. Like I'm suggesting this is at the edge of the entire time period. So there's Mm -hmm. a huge gulf of time. There could be a large, like could be hundreds and hundreds of years between, you know, Robert Baron on the earth and, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, the wonderful, magical fun house of <laughs> of communist utopianism daniel yeah. right? i want you to fucking go <laughs> die in a fucking fire right now i want i want you to go walk around and get crushed by a giant brutalist <laughs> building that's what i want right a now. giant brutalist building so so like okay so i like think of the actual years involved if we're gonna say that it's actually a thousand which we, we i know we were fuzzy on that but if it's actually mm-hmm. a thousand no no we're have, pretty hard on a thousand like a thousand was like very specific yeah, but we were saying that a, a thousand. We, I think we early in the other episode we were interpreting a thousand as being a loose number that could have been millions of years. It all depends on what the gulf of time is. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that yeah. was correct. That's what we were yeah. saying. A but thousand, if we want to say right. it's a thousand, which I'm totally on board with, it makes it easier. Then we can say, you know, Courtney's weather in the middle could be at the what would that be like the the 500 year mark. Yours is at zero and mine is at a thousand. In that case, they're all equally distant and there's a mm-hmm. big gulf between right. them all. You know? So, so you know what? Why don't we do this? Why don't we have it? So mine's at like 1900 and then mm-hmm. that means Courtney's is at 2400 and yours is at yeah. 2800. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, like you, what happens in between, if this is a novel, it could be the narrator has an interstitiary chapter between the two that is like a poem or something mm-hmm. that bridges the mm-hmm. gap in a, in a less rigid way. Mm-hmm. You know, right. And then there's the story. 
No, I also really still like the idea of it being like vague as to what happens in what order. And if you were playing this as a very confusing yeah. RPG, it could almost <laughs> be like, depending on the actions of the players, that mm -hmm. kind of dictates the ultimate end or like I the like ultimate that. like sequence. Because if, for example, the players are ultimately not successful in like forming concrete connections between these moons and the planet then maybe daniel's is the end where they've separated completely whereas if they are like totally successful at making the connections maybe mine's the end where they've come back together and are like forming these connections oh. you know what yeah because I mean? you could go from 1900 wrap around to mm -hmm. 28 and then go to the middle mm. there's yeah. different paths to it yeah well that's confused that's even more it's confusing very, now it's very jesus confusing. christ <laughs> Because you could tell a story where, like, um, it go like I don't know how it would do it, but it would go for because the, the the thematically that would be like trying to gain control over your situation, right? Economically mm -hmm. and and by and and physically, and also trying to reconcile a relationship is what's happening in the 1900 one. And then if we're going backwards or forwards to um, the distant future where the connections are broken, you know, like the way you might literally do that is I don't know they find some kind of forgotten rail that is in fact a doorway to an unknown distant future, but it doesn't have to physically connect them, right? It could just be that the narrative shifts to that because the outcome was like you're saying so dire, they didn't succeed in the labor movement. And so for the RPG in that case, it moves them to the dark period where everyone's dis disconnected, right? Mm -hmm. And then making the connections gets you to the wondrous, um, F fashion boat of brutalist <laughs> magic, you know, instead of going, you know, from where you started. I did, it, I did it again. I can do it all day. I, I still like Lisa Frank brutalism <laughs> as a term. Did you say Lisa Frank brutalism? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Oh my God. That's what it's called. Forget all the words I said. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rob, but not really. <laughs> Didn't Rob say there was like a Lisa Frank Walmart something? Or was it, what was the word? There was like Lisa Frank nihilism. There was something with Walmart. What was the thing you said, Rob, with Walmart? It was, um, it was some kind of literary genre that I didn't know existed. It was awesome. Oh, you're talking about Kmart realism. Kmart, Kmart realism. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. I still love it. But Lisa Frank brutalism. <laughs> yes. I want to live in that world. I can kind of get behind Lisa Frank Bruce. I'm not, not going to lie. It's on board. It's like, so, so the, the, the issue that I have with like an idea of like labor mixed with brutalism is that they're antithetical to one another. The point of brutalism is to make you feel small in, mm -hmm. in response to like the state, right? Like you're looking up at this massive building that represents the state and you are made to feel small as a result. That's why fascists took to brutalism so well. But we can reclaim this that. idea, right? We, the way but, that we reclaim it in Lisa Frank brutalism. It's not through color. It's through space. It's a spatial yes, problem, yes. Daniel. Go, go with me on this fun <laughs> ride to the utopian brutalist communism I'm speaking I'm of. Fucking what happens is just like you said, the building episode is a shit show because you won't just <laughs> let me die, Daniel. <laughs> the buildings represent, like you said, the oppressive power of the state owning the means of production. It's been taken away from the capitalists and given to the state. Now. About People the still don't own it, right? It's about, okay, well, whatever. Right, but the state has – they have the means. The people don't because the state's become this fascist apparatus. But what happens in Lisa Frank brutalism is those <laughs> cold buildings of horror have been splashed with the paint of freedom. And the people have rushed into these buildings and they've seized the means of production. And they've dispelled the, their fascist overlords. And now – through smaller groups, through communal ownership, these buildings remain as reminders of that fascist past because they've been repainted to okay. represent the Lisa Frank mm -hmm. future. It has to be more than – because what you're doing thematically here is quite interesting because mm -hmm. what you're suggesting is that a coat of paint uh -huh. can undo the structural damage that fascistic brutalist architecture implies. No, it can't undo it. That's the point. Right. So We're what you have to do, it can't paint. just be paint. It would have to be structurally. Yeah. Reworked. That's the, it's the first step. The first step is to say okay. these are not cold buildings. These will be warm buildings representing joy. And then the work begins. And then they're that's honeycombed into communal buildings. Yes. And okay. they put like mm. 
plants on sure. them and they put carpets on them and people set up these fun Epcot rails, you know, where they, where yeah, they move carousel all the of little... future. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's what I'm seeing. Or what are those things that are like self-contained building, like arcologies? Yes. They become build arcologies. Into, yeah. Yes. <laughs> like just... self-sustaining. Lisa Frank arcologies. Yes. This episode has gone so far <laughs> off the fucking rails. I love this episode so much now. Mm. I want to do a setting just with Lisa Frank brutalism. Can we do that? Someone submit that prompt, please. <laughs> Why am I picturing that in like um, our Land of a Thousand uh, uh, Spices episode or <laughs> yes. series? Yes. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, that could work. That could definitely work. Anyway. All right. All right. <laughs> we need to move away from this. I feel like we've explored this pretty well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We need to end this for the love of God, please. <laughs> Uh, you gotta I don't away. know what I, I, I from that time period. I don't know what happened. I, I feel like I've head. been roofied this episode, and I'm waking up, and I'm just like I'm sore, and I'm crying, and I don't I'm know why. Send you AI art of this realm. <laughs> That's gonna do it for this episode of World Build with us. Um, remember that if you want us to build your world, uh, you can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com. Click the link, follow the instructions, and within a reasonable amount of time. We'll be building your world. A huge thank you again to the Lord of all Chris's for this particular prompt. Uh, and thank you all for dealing with uh, the gap in between the previous prompt. Now, now things are going to be a little bit different. Things are going to be working a little bit better going forward, hopefully, unless another organ of mine fails. But, <laughs> you know, it's fine. Um, in the meantime, if you want to follow us on social media, don't go to our discord instead. Click the link uh, for this episode description. Come join us. Come chat with us. Come talk to us about world building. Come talk to us about anything but, but brutalist architecture. Lisa Frank brutalism. Thank you. Yeah, Lisa Frank brutalism. That's what it's called. <laughs> and of course, if you want to become a patron, if you're feeling particularly generous or you just want to torment us for whatever reason, you're more than welcome to by clicking on the Patreon link giving money to us and with that you'll get early access to episodes a patron only discord uh other stuff that i can oh oh the double episode i can't i can't forget that you get two episodes if you're a patron compared to just one episode and that's actually been very helpful and very good for us overall we've been able to get through a lot of our prompts lately and with all of that out of the way remember that we love you very much and we're going to get through this together until next week. Mm -hmm.